the teamwork arts podcast ladies and gentlemen this is where we try and go behind the scenes to figure out the thoughts that animate the actions of those who create the arts um there are times when um, when introductions themselves uh, need a podcast of their own and if there's if there's a candidate worthy of that then uh, uh, it has to be uh, mr william dalrymple i mean i don't know where i start uh, because i've been a fan so i'm firstly going to throw away the objectivity of the interviewer for a bit and uh, uh, just tell you that it's an absolute honor uh, to um, to have the opportunity to ask the questions that have been revolving in my head for a very very long time um uh, what do i tell you about him uh, books Photo- photography uh, art curation um uh, being uh, 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 being an honorary fellow at the bodleian being a, 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 a scholar at oxford um writing books that actually tell you about the past so that um, uh, so that we don't repeat the mistakes and uh, uh, and basically someone who knows how to tell a story uh the facility with the language has has been something that has been uh, making my jaw drop every time i've turned a page on a william dalrymple book uh, mr dalrymple uh, thank you very much for joining us thank you sir it's like a pleasure to be chatting to you here <laughs> Uh, so let's start from the beginning i mean uh, the facility with the language and uh, the art of storytelling uh, when 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 did the fascination begin god i don't know i i i have writers in my family virginia wolf is a great aunt um and uh, um there are also even uh, a number of scottish historians way back uh uh who 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 um who who did the same sort of thing as I do now but i don't know i when i was growing up i had um i had a wonderful nanny and aya who used to read me fantastic tale she had a book called tales of scottish keeps and castles uh, and if ever i was good which was but if i broke and, and i would work very hard in order that this would happen uh, i would be read a story from this book and i think I, and i do remember that as kicking off my interest and then we would go off uh, to look at castles or um there were lots of uh, standing stones and iron age hill forts in the part of scotland i grew up because i had a very rural childhood uh, uh i grew up a long way from anywhere really uh in uh, in the borders of scotland um lovely wild country a very happy childhood growing up on the beach in the woods on the hills uh left very much my own devices but always interested in history and archaeology and writing and i have a uh a thing from my primary school age 5 or 6 or something had uh, at one point that somewhere an exercise book where i you know we had to write the essay what do you want to do when you grow up and i they wanted to be uh an author and an archaeologist um and i'm well i'm not an archaeologist but i'm not far off an archaeologist <laughs> and my current book actually does use a lot of archaeology so uh it, i i my very first trip to london which was a long way away from scotland and and as far as i felt growing up in a foreign country in england uh was to go and see the tutankhamun exhibition to put on i think in 1972 or something like that uh when i was about 7 and i begged and begged and begged and my parents took me down to london um uh and uh, the british museum had all the treasures of tutankhamun from egypt and i just remember going around with the jaw dropped to the ground and then interestingly as i came out another sort of thing obviously that, that led to the future um my first sight of india in the form of uh, of harry krishna devotees uh hanging around outside the uh the british museum remember this is the mid 70s but such things were probably a lot more common than they are now this is the george harrison that embraced uh, astral flying and all the rest of it the the, the concept of bangladesh of that sort of period and um i remember you know i don't know which struck me more the the, the treasures of tutan garment inside the british museum or uh, the harry krishna guys in their lungis and the tablas and so on uh, outside it doesn't have to be done like that in rural scotland before. it was it was all very foreign and different So uh um, of course I mean uh, uh, you have spoken so much about the past about the books that you've written already but there's also um uh, the exciting prospect of the golden road uh, uh we can of course uh, tread back to the past because uh we all know how the past is being uh, is being leveraged in the present and that's i i'm sure going to be a great discussion but uh, do tell us about uh, about the the exciting new uh, roads that is being taken 
Well, I, I should first of all, I mean, like any author, I want to promote my work on this sort of thing. This is what I've been doing for the last 20 years with one book. So this is the company called Full Book, uh, which brought me back to in, uh, India in 2002 and I needed to use the uh, National Archives uh, for the last movie, which was the second volume, all the material that was in, in the National Archives. Uh, and at that point, I'd been away from India for a bit, uh, with uh, having small children in those days, uh, all of whom were born uh, in Scotland and London. Uh, and I came back in 19, um, sorry, 2004 um, to write the second book in the in the quartet and, and completed the Anarchy, which was the fourth uh, two years ago, 2019. Um, just before lockdown, it came out. I was able to do the tour and and, uh, and then come back home uh, at the end of it the, 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 uh, and, and begin work on this current project. So, 20 years working on um, the East India Company and this extraordinary story of how not the British government had a Downing Street, but far more in a far more sinister way, a corporation run for profit, run out of the city of London. Many of whom, many of whose employees went on to become MP, and 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 form the laws that allowed these Indian companies to get away with what it did, uh, which was uh, a, a, one of the world's first corporations to hire um, Indian mercenaries, borrow money from Indian bankers, and astonishingly conquer the richest country in the world, uh, as as fate would have it that the company was formed just before India disintegrated at the end of the Mughal Empire. Uh, into one of the periods of, uh, of chaos, uh, which um, uh, uh, it, I call the anarchy. And it was this fragmentation, the fact that India was hundreds of small states rather than one very powerful state, that allowed a corporation, a bunch of businessmen, you know, 10,000 miles away in London, to uh, buy up uh, military power uh, and to use and, and to... And to um, uh, divide and rule, not in the sense that it's often used as a uh, sense of Hindu against Muslim, but using just Indian mercenary to fight other Indian soldiers. Uh, and the great battles of the East India Company, Plassey, Buxar, and so on, were not, uh, by and large, white guys being brave and, and, and beating brown guys. It was one set of brown guys with better weapons uh, and better training uh, beating another set uh, who had more old-fashioned uh, military equipment. Uh, and this was done astonishingly uh, at a distance from London. At the beginning, there were only about 250 uh, uh, Brits in Calcutta controlling the Indian operation. But there was an army of 100,000 sepoys. Uh, Indians paid uh, and, 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 and often with, with money borrowed from Indian bankers. So that's an extraordinary story. It's a, a very interesting story to me because, uh, you know, we'd always been told that this was the British Empire, but it, it's worse, it's much worse. It's a, it's a corporation that existed only to make a profit. There was now the reason for the East India Company to work, you know, to get up in the morning. You work for the East India Company other than to make money. Uh, but they did it uh, the, with, at the end of a bend uh, with this enormous army. The largest modern army in Asia was, was made up of Indians paid by uh, the company. Uh, and it was an extremely ruthless and effective force. Uh, that uh, uh, used the uh, disunity of India um, to turn it into one of the great money-generating instruments of modern history. And uh, I'm from Scotland, as I said, and, you know, uh, all around me where I grew up were these big country houses, these lovely Georgian mansions, mainly now owned by the National Trust and open to the public where you can go and buy a, a cream tea and uh, pay your two pounds or whatever it is to go around this house and look at the treasure. A lot of those houses, I mean, like kind of, you know, the majority in the early 1800s were built with money looted from India as a result of the military victories of the company uh, in India uh, and the looting of places like in you know, Bhutan's capital, Sri Rangapatna, then later the Lucknow at the time of 1857 and, and so on. Uh, and Scotland particularly, which was, you know, even more than Britain as a whole, specifically Scotland, was a very, very poor country at the end of the 17th century. Uh, you know, uh, the rich countries were Spain and Portugal, which had the money pouring in from the world, plus uh, Italy from its trading power and France. Uh, Britain was on the edge and Scotland was on the edge of Britain uh, uh, and, was, and was really by, you know, very poor by any standard. But by the end of the 18th century, with money flowing in from, uh, from India, 
uh, Scotland became one of the richest countries in Europe. And that was the seed money which then produced the Industrial Revolution, which, which by the end of the 19th century had made Britain the biggest economy in the world. So it, to me, this was both an extraordinary story in itself. It was a story that seemed to explain a lot about my family and where I came from. Um, uh, it's also uh, now interesting because I think when I started this book, neither colonialism nor uh, you know economic history seemed to be particularly uh, uh, something that people were fighting to write about. But now, obviously, colonialism is a massive subject. You know. Uh, one of the largest non-fiction sellers in Indian history was Shashi Tharoor's uh, Inglorious Empire. Uh, but we also, you know, we are living at a time when we're all terrified of the power of big corporations. Google, Facebook, spying on us, reading our mails, harvesting data from our purchases and so on. Uh, these are big subjects now. And we're aware that, you know, big corporations are more powerful than large states. Uh, and in many ways, you know, the, uh, Google and uh, uh, sort of Elon Musk, you know, is richer than most individually than most African countries. Uh, Tesla sure. and Google and Microsoft all have um, turnovers larger than the GDPs of, uh, of most of um, the developing world. Uh, sure. so, so what was fascinating to me was that these books seem to explain all this. And, this is all a very long way to say that, that, that I've been doing this for 20 years and I've now finished it. And what I'm doing next, which is the original question, <laughs> is, um, uh, is the Golden Road, which is a completely different uh, thing and goes back to my earlier interest in archaeology, which is what I uh, first brought me to India when I, I wanted originally to study archaeology at Cambridge. I spent all my childhood holidays digging on excavations. And when I first came here, it was the places like Sanchi, Ajanta, uh, and the very early sites of, uh, of Indian history, Ellora and so on, uh, which were the, the things I was really interested in and I came to see. Uh, and um, having done this 20 years of work, got it all finished in a box uh, and out in the shops, one last product placement. <laughs> um, I'm now free in a sense to go back to uh, stuff that's interested me for years. And, and the story of this book, is a story which has not really been written. Although, you know, India, uh, we, we hear so much chess beating these days about, you know, um, the glories of ancient India, the, uh, the, the wonderful ancient Indian past and so on. There's still amazingly little, little written that's, that's really uh, up to date, uh, interesting, readable on particularly the subject I'm focusing on, which is how Indian culture spread out of India. Um, in the early centuries AD, I'm looking particularly at period about 500, 600, 700, up to about 1200, when India did what Greece had done earlier in Europe, which was to spread its culture and civilization out over a continent. So part one of the book is the story of Indian Buddhism going off uh, northwards towards China, uh, through what's now Pakistan, Afghanistan, Gandhara, through Western China, into China, and by the 7th century taking over China. Buddhism, and Buddhism became the state religion of China under the Empress Wu Zetian, who was what, this extraordinary figure I'm going to have great fun writing about, who was this uh, amazing woman ruler who started off as a concubine uh, and through ruthlessness and using her various skills, ended up as the wife of the emperor, then the emperor herself. Um, and in all, as the Confucian establishment didn't like women ruling, she converted China to Buddhism in order to give her more power. And she brought in Buddhist specialists who were, of course, Indian. So you get the succession of Indians briefly. It doesn't last for long, but you get this, this moment, which sort of uh, in the mid 7th century, and suddenly you have an Indian takeover of China, you know, the oldest, grandest civilization other than India in the world. Um, so this is the first story. The second story is the whole story, which I've just come back from researching in Southeast Asia, the story of how Hinduism and Buddhism spread down to the lands of gold, Savarnabhumi, to first Sri Lanka, then Burma, Thailand, Java, Sumatra, Vietnam, and particularly Cambodia, where I'm going to be focusing. And eventually the story of how the largest Hindu temple in the world came to be built not in India, but in Cambodia. Uh, uh, Angkor Wat is a, yeah. is a, is a nation out of temple. And uh, it is, you know, about, it, it's um, 
built around the same sort of time as the big Chola temple in Tanjung, but it's about, I don't know, 30 times bigger. Uh, and, uh, and how did that happen? So that's the second bit of the story. And the third bit of the story is Indian uh, numbers, astronomy and mathematics going westwards first to the Arab world, and then from Baghdad out, right out to uh, Andalusia, and, and uh, then to Italy, and then being taken by Fibonacci, who grew up in Algeria and learned what uh, he described as Indian numbers. Uh, because the Arabs, even though, you, as far as Europe was concerned, this, is, this was Arabic numbers, which is what we still call them today. And Fibonacci knew them as the Arabs uh, know them even now, as Indian numbers. So that's the third story. So there's these three stories. And, and it's interesting because, again, you know, we have all this chess beating, uh, particularly from the right, about Indian culture. But there's, you know, there's a lot of sort of uh, nonsense out there about nuclear weapons at the time of the Mahabharat and, uh, and, and the plastic surgery in, in Vedic India and, and, uh, and all this sort of thing. But the, re the real story of how Indian civilization seeded the whole of Asia, uh, and then sent its mathematics and science uh, westward, needs no exaggeration. It needs no uh, spin and no fantasy, uh, because it's an extraordinary tale. And, and in a sense, to have the privilege to write this uh, and to put into one book this whole story uh, in a way that doesn't seem to have been done before um, uh, is, is a very exciting prospect. And, and I'm, I've just come back. The one thing that's holding me up was, was I couldn't get to Southeast Asia. I couldn't get to Cambodia, Java, uh, Sumatra, um, and, and all, the, all the other places that I'd longing to get to. I'd been to them all before, but I needed, obviously, to see them again with fresh eyes. Now I was writing the book. And I've just come back from there. So I'm now putting the final threads together, and uh, we'll begin writing, hopefully, in March or April. Excellent. Uh, there's also this uh, thing about, uh, you know, history that uh, it teaches us lessons and uh, we were told in, in many uh, half understood uh, essays that I had read of uh, everyone from Ramchandra Guha to Romila Thapar telling us that if we learn, don't learn from the mistakes, we are doomed to repeat them. Um, there seems to be, uh, as you said, uh, wielding history as a weapon seems to have uh, uh, become a bit of an order of the day. And, uh, you know, we're living in an age where information is largely being confused with knowledge. Information as a passive um, uh, tome is there for everyone. But uh, knowledge is an active pursuit, is it not? And right now, cherry picking uh, instances from history uh, to instead of uh, increasing knowledge, uh, push an ad agenda is becoming uh, is becoming more and more prevalent. You think history is more becoming more of a weapon than knowledge in in this day and age? Well, there are certain parts of the world, and India is one of them, where history is highly contested. And uh, two neighbors living next door to each other will have completely different visions of what that <coughs> history is. It's not unique. Uh, you know, you get the same thing in Northern Ireland. Catholics have a very different view of history to Protestants there. You have the same thing in Palestine and Israel, uh, where Israelis and Palestinians have completely different versions of what happened in that part. Uh, and, and different ideas of who's the victim and who's the aggressor. Uh, and the same is true of, uh, of India, uh, Indian Muslims, Pakistan. This whole... Um, noxious uh, triangle, which has been gnawing away at the well-being of this area for, for, for 100 years now. Uh, and the whole question of, you know, the, particularly after 1947, who was responsible for partition, whose fault was it, who wanted it? Was it uh, uh, Indian Muslims taking refuge against uh, Hindu aggression, or was it um, Muslim separatists wanting their own uh, land at the expense of India and, 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 and expelling hundreds of people by force? Uh, you know, there, you get very different versions, obviously, in the textbooks of Pakistan and India, uh, but also uh, within. Uh, and uh, the difference between the Nehruvian uh, version of history and, and the current Hindutva version of history is massive. They're different heroes, different personalities, completely different version of events. And, um, well, there's several things to be said. I mean, first of all, it is true that Indian history in the post-independence era was largely written by left-leaning historians. Uh, that is a, is, is a matter of, of record. A lot of the great historians of the 1950s and 60s were left-leaning or Marxist, 
uh, some were card carrying Marxists, uh, like um, uh, a lot of the Aligarh uh, Muslim historians were openly and proudly Marxist. Um, and even today, there are very few senior historians of India of any repute who are of the right. And this is something um, that you and I have, have, have to wrestle with every year that we put on uh, the Jaipur Literature Festival, because <laughs> there are there are hundreds of very articulate uh, uh, left-wing historians with doctorates and books to their name and prizes they've won, and remarkably few right-wing ones. Which is not the case, for example, where I when I went to Cambridge. You know, when 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 I was at college, there were very good right-wing historians and there were very good left-wing historians, and you would um, you know choose between them. But uh, you know it, that both were highly learned and that both gave versions of events which could be argued coherently from evidence um uh, uh was a certainty that you know you weren't dealing with with one lot lot just making up evidence and the other lot uh holding the truth that there, there were two different versions of history from the same set of data where where the the, the, the tragedy with with the situation uh, in India is that you have a whole generation now who believe that their history has been distorted. Um, and, and, yet, and yet very few competent right-wing historians um, with doctorates, with, with serious teaching positions, uh, and, and with the experience. Um, and so, so you do, I mean, there is, a, there, there is an interesting issue here. The other thing which is related to this is that where I come from and the tradition which I've uh, studied in and 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 write it. Um, there is there is a whole world of serious historians who write for a general audience. So, for example, um, Simon Sharma, who we've had endlessly at the Jaipur Festival, you know, is a is one of the world's uh, most uh, acclaimed uh, historians. He's taught at Oxford, he's at Cambridge, he's taught now teaches at Columbia in New York, but he writes books and does television programs that ordinary people can understand and enjoy. Uh, the same is true of someone like Stephen Greenblatt, whose book, The Swerve, uh, was the number one New York Times bestseller, won a Pulitzer, uh, but he's the, you know, the leading authority on Shakespeare at Harvard. Um, there is no Indian equivalent of that. We do not have in this country major historians who are at the top rank academically, who also are at the top rank uh, in terms of literary production or, or, or making things available to the general uh, reader. But William, if I may, uh, you know, uh, the thing is that uh, there's also a, a question that keeps popping up in my head when uh, when discussion of history is concerned. Uh, uh, as I said, those half understood articles uh, from the likes of Romila Thapar, etc. Had these, um, uh, you know, we were told about the subaltern uh, gaze. We were told about a certain way of looking at history. There's also a little bit of intimidation because this is very scholarly in that way. And as is uh, the case in, in most art, uh, um, the next movement is usually a reaction to the excesses of the previous movement. Um, uh, so, in a way, what we are seeing right now, uh, I, and do correct me if I'm wrong, in a way, what we're seeing right now is the fact that th uh, this is actually a reaction to uh, to the perceived arrogance of um, of the intelligentsia who were, as you said, left leaning. Uh, and now uh, the the subject of history is not as important as history being used as a, a vehicle to say that oh look you were shown up to be um, uh, uh, you be, to be less intelligent and this is your time to stand up for what we are telling you because that is right and those who, were, who told you uh, whatever they did earlier was actually their intellectual arrogance could that be a reason as well. Well, I agree. I mean, I think, you know, you mentioned subaltern studies. Subaltern studies is an example, in a sense, of, of what went wrong, in that, on one hand, it's a, it's a, a remarkable project uh, done by leading historians uh, to recover the voice of the unrepresented uh, A brilliant thing. You can have no argument with, with the aim. But the reality was a lot of the essays were written in uh, a dense academic language, academies. Um, which That's was impenetrable to most people, yeah. and, and which was written you know, very specifically with other historians uh, uh, of similar inclination in mind. Uh, and in a sense, you know, it was a private language 
um, the subaltern studies speak, uh, which uh, was full of, uh, 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 of language that, you know, you would not use in everyday life uh, and often seemed to go out of its way uh, to complicate what was often quite a simple concept. Also, I, th I think they also looked down their nose at people who tried to explain it in a language that was more accessible to someone thinking that uh, it would water down the uh, the erudition of the of the whole exercise. Well, this I say, you know, is the is the tragedy because you know if you compare historians working at the at the top of their game in Harvard, many of them will write books that will win Pulitzer prizes and will be read by you know the same sort of middle-class readers who would read uh, a Salman Rushdie or an Arundhati Roy or a uh, Amitabh Ghosh, you know, the, 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 the sort of uh, average intelligent reader uh, who wants to read something uh, serious and good, uh, but can read uh, uh, one of these novels with enjoyment. Now, when I arrived in India, and this is, I mean, this is uh, relevant in a sense to this, to this discussion, because in a sense, I've made my career in this country in the fault line between this, because there was so little accessible history being written uh, that was serious and was winning prizes. Um, and, and you had a very odd situation when I, when I came back here in 2004, in that Indian fiction was winning prizes everywhere. So every single year, particularly that time, but even more then than now, um, you had an Indian uh, always on the on the on the short list and, and often winning uh, the Booker Prize for fiction, but the Indian non-fiction world was only in its infancy. There were virtually no uh, Indians ever winning the non-fiction equivalent, which was, which is called the Samuel Johnson Prize, uh, now called the Bailey Gifford. Uh, and uh, still to this day, I think an entire history of the prize, which has been going you know, 20, 25 years now, I think there's only been two Indians ever shortlisted for it, which is Samant Subramaniam and Ram Guha's cricket book was long listed once. So we have a very odd situation whereby we have, uh, in a sense, you know, the, if, if India was, uh, uh, if, if, we, if we, in cricketing terms, uh, India would have the, you know, the world's leading um, fiction first 11 with star batsman Arundhati <laughs> Roy. Uh, you know, fast bowler, Abhijit Ghosh, uh, brilliant, uh, uh, brilliant fielding from uh, from Salman Rushdie and Vikram Seth, yeah, you know, and so on. But the equivalent Indian non-fiction cricket team um, would be, you know, more like Afghanistan or Scotland. <laughs> uh, that, that, that there was no tradition for years in the country uh, of uh, of academics or others writing non-fiction to the same high level. Uh, there were a few people, uh, I mean, the two uh, examples of people that have done spectacularly well, uh, Ramchandra Gua, uh, whose uh, books on, on modern and contemporary history uh, win prizes around the world and are hugely respected. The other example, not resident here, but, uh, but very much uh, uh, an Indian um, uh, uh, in, in blood and birth, uh, is Siddhartha Mukherjee. Whose, whose work on, whose, for example, The Emperor of All Maladies, Absolutely. his book on cancer, won the, won the Pulitzer. Um, so, but it, it's, it's an odd thing. And, you know, it, it, you have this brilliant fiction tradition and this up to now slightly lame non-fiction tradition. And that, going back to your question, is one of the reasons why ordinary people in this country have not read their history and do not have a sophisticated understanding of their history. So... You, know, you have these airy statements being issued that you know, Hinduism is the oldest religion in the world, or that uh, uh, you know, the, um, yeah, you, you know, you know the the, the truth. The famous <laughs> facts are not facts. I mean, facts are uh, are sec. So the so the, the so there is a there is a problem here. Uh, you you have a, a highly intelligent middle class here with a voracious appetite for knowledge, who are not being given the intellectual uh, sustenance that they need in nonfiction. Uh, and the, the, the books that are on offer are often very scholarly, but pretty dry. I mean, a, a classic example of that, in my view, and, and, and some may well disagree, and I don't want in any way to, uh, uh, to, to sound like I'm uh, criticizing her, but I mean, Romana Tharpa, 
great historian, fantastic uh, scholar, uh, world-beating uh, understanding of early India, but not a writer you'd take to the beach with me, uh, in the same way that you would take Stephen Greenblatt or, um, uh, or Simon Shum. You could read those guys on holiday and, uh, and, un and enjoyably understand a period of history. Uh, and, I mean, what's wonderful is that that's changing now. You are getting um, a, a whole new generation of historians who are coming up, who are writing brilliantly. Um, and, uh, and so, for example, later on this afternoon, I'm, I'm, I'm having an interview with a, a wonderful new star called Annie Rudd Canassetti, whose book called Lords of the Deccan, of course. Uh, we'll be launching at Jaipur, uh, but is an extraordinary book on the Chalukyas and the Rastrakutas. Now, there is an example. Those are two great dynasties that controlled great chunks of India for uh, hundreds of years, which no one in the middle has had anything to read about. I mean, when was the last time anyone reached for a book of the Chalukyans at their, uh, for, their, for their beach read or you know, their, their holiday uh, in the hills? Uh, you know... Uh, William, uh, there was a... Another example, Aaron Makoti, you know, all these people producing yeah. books that you want to read, uh, which is not saying that, you know, they are, they are scholarly, they're well-written, they're well-researched, uh, but they're books that you pick up and put in your back, uh, as opposed to, you know, an issue of the Subaltern Study, which, you know, you, you, you throw out the window halfway up the similar on your, your yeah. holiday read, however wonderful they may <laughs> You know, uh, there was a time when I, I think it was the it was the White Mughals, I think, that was being launched at that time at the British Council. Uh, there was a whole evening of uh, ghazals uh, before the launch. And I, I was there as a journalist covering it. And uh, I had uh, had the opportunity to briefly interview you. And at that point of time, you said all the information that I have gathered is from here, is from the National Archives. All information is available at the National Archives. And I am, um, uh, I, it makes me very sad to say, but I'm going to say it to the camera. And you point to the camera and, and you said, I'm going to say it to the camera that there are not enough people uh, who are using that knowledge, who are leveraging what they have already in front of them. There's not enough effort. Um, but as you said, that seems to be changing now. The, the, the feistiness of, of telling a story that is based firmly in fact um, uh, seems to be something that uh, that is uh, as you said Ira Mukoti, Anchan Malhotra, uh, uh, you know Manu Pillai they're, they're all telling stories which are based in fact but they are essentially stories it's like uh, it, 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 it's, a, it's a basic human and outside India this is nothing surprising I mean you know it, both in America and in Britain the two markets I know uh, well and, and, and have tried to compete in you know, there are hundreds of nonfiction books like that, which are written by scholars uh, of the highest repute, but which you want to read. Uh, but my they tell, you know, as as much and if not more than than the fiction is. So my point. Yeah. My point was that, you know, uh, from that time, uh, research, especially uh, the kind of research that is required to tell a story and the way to mold that research into making it palatable has uh, has uh, improved by leaps and bounds, hasn't it? I mean, the, the quality of research and the quality of storytelling have both uh, improved. Do you think that is also because the audiences that are consuming that now are not burdened as much as, say, my generation was with the burden of what we were taught with, uh, with what we carried forward like you know the subaltern studies the, the books that we had read etc do you think the audience has to do with it as well I, i'm sure that, that, that it does and, and people i mean i for example i read over over um new year on the beach i read upinda things ancient india uh, and that started with a with a sort of mea culpa uh, in its introduction uh, where it said you know we indian academics have not written for the general public and there is a problem now because people have all sorts of odd ideas about the past. Uh, which uh, which we have have not addressed and, and, and questions we have not answered. And here's my attempt, uh, right, Supinder and her introduction uh, in ancient India, which I highly recommend. It's a, it's a wonderful, short, palatable introduction to ancient India by one of the greatest scholars of the subject. Um, uh, he, uh, and there is a book which which simply didn't exist 20 years ago. Uh, there was nothing like that. I mean, I suppose the last thing that was produced like that about ancient India, an, an overall book which you'd really want to pick up was Basham's The Wonder That Was India. Uh, now very old fashioned uh, to, to read now, but still, uh, still, you know, a book that you would read with pleasure by a scholar. 
there's of course fact and then there's the way you tell that fact and then there is the way that fact is treated uh, by everyone around you think in today's uh, situation especially in india the elbow room to tell uh, uh, to actually relate a fact as it is is shrinking because of all the noise that is generated around it because of all the agendas that are foisted because everyone has two opinions on on social media isn't it uh, so no matter what you want to tell how it's heard is a different matter altogether so do you think that space is uh, is shrinking a little uh, will you well i think it's it's a complicated thing i mean on one hand Social media, particularly Twitter, is a wonderful way for a writer to publicize their work and get it better known. Um, I, I, I use Twitter a lot. I have a million followers, and it's a fantastic way if I'm giving a lecture, for example, to, to make sure I get a, you know, if I'm, if I'm going down to Kerala or to Wisconsin or to um, the Chalk Valley History Festival in rural Wiltshire, if, if I tweet that I'm going to give a lecture a couple of times, you can double the audience. And, and that's a terrific thing that you know just didn't exist uh, uh, when I was starting but as we know Twitter has a has a darker side and um, it's very easy to uh, to uh, come out very bruised and I know many people who who have got themselves into very bruising Twitter arguments and uh, and, and and you know and slam down their phones and I'm giving up my Twitter account or I'm never going to go on social media again um, I think there are there are simple rules which help. Uh, my rule with, with Twitter is uh, if someone engages, disagrees with me, but engages politely and, and, and uh, reasonably, I, I'm always happy to engage. If someone is rude uh, and makes an ethnic slur or, uh, or, or, or um, produces some personal insult, I just block. Uh, and that's that. Uh, and that seems to make life a lot easier. Um, uh, if, if, if you block outright rudeness but engage politely uh, and I've often found that people who, who initially may start a little bit hostile if you treat them politely and reasonably uh, will immediately revert to norm their normal polite selves because why often you find these people you know when you meet them uh, are completely charming it's just that for some reason Twitter brings out a sort of <laughs> angriness that, uh, that uh, you know most people don't uh, uh, behave in that manner face-to-face uh, -face, uh, or in a pub or in a restaurant or at a party. It, uh, there is a sort of anger that Twitter can generate. But I, I use it. I think it's a fantastic tool. And uh, it doesn't, I've no doubt that it's, you know, got my work out to far more people that otherwise uh, huh? wouldn't know. And, and that's why I bother with it. Every day I, I bother, you know, take, putting stuff out. I'm, at the moment, for example, I'm uh, putting out lots of stuff about the Golden Road and from my research and pictures in Cambodia. And, uh, and you know, you get pressure certainly that, that you know it's creating a, uh, a a whole world of interest to people that will will hopefully go out and buy the book when it when it comes out so social media it can be a very useful asset to a writer but uh, as you say there are areas which are very sensitive um i mean i i found that state you know i've written about orangzeb i've written about the late moguls i've written about some areas which are very shivaji uh, which are very heavily contested areas. Now, I found that in general, if you're transparent, polite, open, uh, and careful, that you don't get your facts wrong, that you uh, admit when you're wrong, uh, and that you uh, engage politely with people that engage politely with you, that it, it, it's still possible to talk about these things in most cases on social media. Occasionally, it can go badly wrong. You can get quoted out of context. You suddenly find yourself on some... Uh, nutty far right wing website uh, being pilloried <laughs> for stuff you yeah. say, but in general, I think you know it, it is a useful tool, uh, and 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 it is still possible. There are some historians, though, you know, and I, who who I, I feel have in a sense brought calamity on themselves. I won't name any names, but there's one particular historian based in America uh, who deals with highly sensitive issues about uh, um, uh, Shivaji and and the late Mogul, and so on, um, who. Um, seems to almost invite uh, uh, anger and, uh, uh, and, you, and, you know, it is like anything else in life. You've got to be sensitive to people's feelings, that you've got to put things uh, in, in politely, which doesn't... But there's also... The, the, the truth clearly. The, there's also this thing about social media, uh, 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 William, that everything is now shrinking down to that one sense, that you need to be seen to be doing everything. Everything needs to be seen. You need to be seen to be reading a book, seen to be uh, uh, listening to music, seen to be eating. Um, 
as far as the audiences are concerned, you know, as you said, uh, there is also an aura around an activity that has been created largely because of social media as well. Um, do you think that has uh, anything to do with the quality of audience that you get? Uh, do you think that, as you said, you put it out on Twitter, you get more people, but uh, how many of them would be coming in for the genuine love for uh, uh, for what you're talking about? And how many would be coming in to click a photograph and put it on uh, on social media? Well, I, again, I, you know, I don't think it's a bad thing that people want to be seen to read, for example. Uh, mm. I'm very pleased if people put out that they've read uh, a book uh, of mine. I'm Equally, you know, when I've enjoyed a book, it's read as, for example, Annie Rood kind of said, his Lords of the Deccan, which I'll be talking about shortly. Um, it's, it's very nice to be able to recommend a book to other people and, and, and have them uh, read it and appreciate it. Um, it, this can be a good thing. You can spin this into, you know, this is hay that you can spin into gold. Um, sure. Uh, and um, you know, every night I watch things on Netflix or uh, that people have recommended on Twitter. I recently, fantastic, you, I know you're a great music buff, the, the spectacular new Velvet Underground documentary, for example. I, I, I totally oh, yeah. missed that when it came out. I hadn't uh, seen it in any of the papers, but uh, someone recommended it on Twitter. I got it out at night. Uh, and, and watched it. It was the most enjoyable documentary I've seen in a year. And, and I've suddenly look on Lou Reed with rather different light. To, uh, <laughs> <I was involved. laughs> of course, so like that, you know, these things, like like everything in life, you know, there 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 is good and there is bad. And you can you can uh, attract the good and and generate good. Um, but if you if you go around shouting and stomping and uh, being insensitive, you 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 bring that bad karma back on yourself a million times. There's there's also talk of 280 characters and 30 second reels, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Everyone's talking about sh uh, you know shrinking attention spans. Has that affected the way that you write, uh, William? Uh, is that ever a consideration in the way that you present your work? I, I don't think that that is true. I mean, uh, you know, yes, you have a certain number of characters on Twitter, but equally, you, uh, uh, you can put out threads. I've just been talking this afternoon before <laughs> I came on about the Pastel Putties, the uh, uh, the the this Shaivite sect that were incredibly important spreading uh, uh, devotion to Lord Shiva around Southeast Asia in the fifth sixth century. Now I ended up doing a thread of thirty tweets, uh, which is you know like a small article, uh, and uh, uh, you know hopefully this will draw attention to the book and, and create an audience for it when it comes out. Uh, you, you can you can do that equally. I, you know, there is no question that big, serious books get read. Ram Guha has produced two monsters on Gandhi, um, which are, I think, one is 1,200 and one is 1,000. You know, these are enormous books, but they are, were bestsellers. Uh, sure. So if you, if you, if you uh, craft your work carefully, write well, research interestingly, uh, people will still take on... I mean, the other best example of... of Fast books that did spectacularly well uh, is J.K. Rowling. Um, sure. uh, Harry Potter got generations of kids from all over the world to uh, uh, discover what our generation and, uh, and your generation discovered with Lord of the Rings. And, and uh, you Absolutely. know, that, that a, fat, a fat book can be yeah. a completely thrilling book. Agreed. So Absolutely. it is true. I mean, I, I like anyone else, you know, we'll have evenings when I'm tired and we'll just scroll on Instagram and, and spend three seconds looking at a picture of you know, someone's dinner, a, a picture of a, a nice building and, uh, uh, and, and a sunset in Goa or something. Um, but, but, uh, but equally, you know, there are other days when I will wake up and, 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 and attempt uh, a big history book or a, a serious work of philosophy or something like that. And, and people do still like to be challenged. I think, you know, the, uh, the fact that, you know, Thomas Piketty was a bestseller. Uh, we have coming to Jaipur. Um, uh, uh, this wonderful archaeologist, David Wengro, who's written, a, again, an enormous fat uh, archaeology book on, on early humanity. Uh, which is like a sort of serious uh, academic uh, version of, of Sapiens and, uh, uh, and the Noah Hariri books. Uh, uh, and, sure. and again, you know, this is not an easy read. It's a dense uh, academic book, but it's sold in, in, in hundreds of thousands of 
I, I remember having picked up uh, the Con Igledons and the uh, and the Alex Rutherfords of the world because I got to know about Faction and I read all about them and and the Caesar uh, series as well and all that and um, uh, you know um, there's uh, you know th th there's that whole thing where uh, as in music the the classical exponents will always look down on fusion you know uh, have you faced a, a bit of derision for the way that you treat history uh, in the way you write your books. Well, I, I don't write. I don't write faction. I write. I write nonfiction very clearly, and, and my books have won, you know, all the major nonfiction prizes. Going, I've won you know, the U.S. Council for Foreign Relations, the Wilson Prize for History, the Samuel Johnson, blah 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 blah. Uh, and so, no, I think you know, I, I, I take I take five years for a book, and and they get reviewed. I mean, not everyone will like them. There'll be those that will disagree with them. But this is not faction. This is this is non-fiction yeah. written in a narrative yeah. form. It's very different. Yeah. Um, I myself am suspicious of. I personally don't enjoy reading historical novels because I continually want to know what actually happened. Uh, you know, I'll, occasionally I will read something like Robert Graves' Count Belisario or I Claudius, you know, which are wonderful and and very learned takes. But I, as a historian, I just get irritated if, if I know someone's inventing stuff <laughs> and um that said i do enjoy a good um a, a good movie which will send me back to the sources so the first thing you know that you know i did when i when when i went to see gladiator was to dive back uh, into uh in, into oh, yes. my room in history books and find out what actually happened uh, and that could be very useful you know, if, if a, a movie can make you um or a book can make you go back to the non-fiction. If it uh, triggers, and, yeah, absolutely. And, 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 and uh, you know, make you want to know what happened. If, if a Highlander, whatever it's called, it can make you go back and read proper books on, on Scottish history, <laughs> and then, then that's great. Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess anything that triggers the imagination is great. And of course, uh, from thousands of words that you write to uh, uh, to the pictures that you click, which speak a thousand words in themselves. You you recently had a, 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 an exhibition of your photographs as well, which were phenomenal because you actually tell stories through uh, through pictures as well. Uh, wh what's the what's the difference between the experiences of uh, triggering someone's ex uh, uh, imagination purely through words? or showing it so much in 3D? So I, I've always loved photography. Photography is one of my first interests. I, my great aunt died when I was, I think, eight, left me money to buy a camera. And ever since then, I think when I, from about the age of 13, I started developing my own photographs in the days when uh, we had dark rooms at school and that sort of thing, and we were swapping oh, around yes. with and fixing and stuff. And, um, I won prizes quite early on when I was 14 or 15. And so that was always one of my interests. And it recently come back. Um, someone very sweetly offered me a show, uh, first of all, uh, in Goa, uh, at, uh, and then at the Videra Gallery in, uh, in Delhi, and then finally the Grosvenor Gallery in London. And I now have a, a very nice sort of second career um, <laughs> with you know, two or three exhibitions a year around the globe. Um, and um, it, it, it's a great pleasure. One of the nicest things about it is it does use a different part of the brain to what you're using as a writer. So, you know, particularly in the evening, I'll come in exhausted from my study and will, uh, uh, after a day, of taking notes and, and planning a, a, a book. And processing pho photographs uh, on Snapseed on my phone uh, <laughs> occupies a completely different part of the brain, the same sort of brain that quite enjoys, you know, just going through Instagram, the visual part of your brain, sure. uh, the non-intellectual, the non-verbal part of your brain. Um, and just to, you know, increase the contrast or to, or to crop or whatever it is you're doing with the photograph, I find it a very satisfying way of spending an evening if, if you have, have, you're not going out or you haven't got a movie or something. And, and I, I love doing it. It's a, it's a huge pleasure. And as I say, it uses a completely different part of the brain and it's a completely different process with Words, everything is considered, everything is written and rewritten, repolished, written again, and second draft, third draft, fourth draft, and then finally you have something which is uh, uh, tenable and, 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 and can be published. Um, but with a photograph, it's instant. You could improve it, certainly through editing and, and cropping, but uh, uh, nothing can save a flawed photograph 
if you failed, if you missed the shot. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, uh, there's no there's no second drafts for a for a completely failed first first shot of it. <laughs> and um, but it's a little more immediate, is isn't it, William? Yet it's intuitive and it's visual. Um, and you know we're all we're all a mixture of different qualities, and and it's nice to have a, do something completely different to, um, uh, to words, even if both at the end of the day are staring into some sort of screen and and, and fiddling. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, finally, of course, uh, you know, there's uh, writing is a very solitary process. Every writer tells me that it's a very very solitary process. Uh, what's yours? How do you uh, process the information? Put it into a book, and what's the process? So it suits me. I have to say, I'm very happy. I'm very sociable. And in the evening, I like to get out. Um, <laughs> but I, I mean, in, in a normal world, unlike at the moment, when you and I are in semi-lockdown in Delhi and, you know, restaurants are closed and, and parties are cancelled and the curfew kicks off at 10 uh, and all our social lives are being hobbled. Uh, in a normal world, I would, you know, I'm very happy to uh, to work on my own all day, but go out in the evening. Um, my process is that I normally, uh, my books are normally four or five year project. Part one is beginning to do the secondary reading of stuff that's been written on a subject for, uh, even as I'm on the book tour for the last one. Because these days, you know, to make a living with a book, you hopefully can, will sell it, in, you know, around the world that you can do a tour in America, or in Australia, in Europe, India, uh, and two or three European countries. Uh, and that way you can make a living. Uh, for a book. So these days, a book tour for me normally takes at least three months. Uh, sometimes it, it can it can ramble on into six or even a year if you're not careful. Um, so getting down in year one to reading the secondary stuff, really knuckling down to archival research in year two, finishing it year three, and then the last two years writing and, um, uh, and editing. My process is, is generally I take notes into a laptop where I have a date line, but I also have old fashioned card indexes for topics, people and places. So when I come say to describe 18th century lap now, I'll have 20 cards full of notes on 18th century lap now. Uh, or when I come to describe Robert Clive, I'll have 20 cards, uh, what a, a complete uh, ruthless uh, <laughs> brute Robert Clive was, or, or, or how charming <laughs> Richard Allen was, or whatever it was. <laughs> Uh, so I use card, old-fashioned card index to accumulate over over time. Uh, Golden Road, the day nine is about 750 pages at the moment. And there are three boxes of cards. There'll probably be four boxes and a thousand uh, pages of date nine by the time I get writing. Uh, it'll take probably a year to write and then uh, two or three months to edit um, the final draft. Uh, or they can... The, the final draft can end, you always think it's going to be two or three months, it ends up being four or five by the time you've done the captions and the uh, and the photographs and the check the index and, you know, and done all the nitty gritty. It goes on and on and on and on. You keep thinking you've finished it and you never have. Uh, but I'd say, yeah, they're five year, they're five year process, of which, you know, year one and year two are great fun. And the writing is the nearest thing in this job that comes to proper hard work. It's like doing an exam or going to the dentist. I dread it. <laughs> the worst bit is the first month and a half um, because you're often floundering. For sure. Anarchy, I've been lucky. I, I, it came very smoothly. I wrote the first third in about eight weeks um, wow. of, 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 of Delhi summer during the whole of that film. Nothing was happening. Um, uh, and, um, yeah, so now I'm about to go into that process again. I think I've got... But do you, uh, uh, William, do you do you enjoy the marketing process of a book? Do you, do you enjoy that process? I because it's important, it. isn't it? No, it's really important. And, it's, and I say, you know, it's one year in five. Right? Um, you know, you will spend one year in five going around. And in, now in India, given all the literary festivals that are kicked off in the aftermath of of uh, uh, Jaipur, <laughs> yeah. uh, again, you could easily spend, yeah, it, it can be very enjoyable. You can spend each weekend, one week in Kerala, one week in, in Bangalore, another week in Dehradun, <laughs> and a, 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 a nice weekend in Calcutta. Uh, it, 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 it can, if, if, if you're disciplined about saying no 
after a bit. Uh, uh, if you're unwise, it can uh, lead to, you know, endless distraction forever and never getting to another book written. But I certainly would, uh, I, I like to try and get the main bulk of the book tour done in three months. Normally right. start in either India or Britain, a bit of Europe, a bit of America, a bit of Australia, Hong Kong. Uh, and then you accept, you accept what um, invitations you like thereafter to nice places like Kerala or whatever. But um, by year two, you should be saying no. And uh, uh, also, you know, after a while, you get bored stiff at the sound of your own voice. And you, uh, while at the beginning, you're thinking creatively, how do I, you know, reduce a, a, a 600 page book to a one hour talk? Uh, by as early as, you know, a month, it, you're just repeating and saying exactly sure. the same thing. Day after day, and, and to what the questions all are. Um, and, and finally, uh, William, uh, in this day and age when information is becoming increasingly a tool, uh, what do you see uh, as the future of uh, history and historical research? Do you see a future, and what kind of future do you see? Well, I suppose the good thing about these Indian culture wars over history is that people are taking an interest in it. Even even those who are not trained in history and are deeply suspicious of historians, uh, the sort who will uh, go onto Twitter and, and denounce anyone in print as a historian, uh, even they are, tend to be engaging. So I feel, you know, these, these, are, these are wars that can be won. Uh, people want to know about history, if you engage politely and prove your case. Um, these, you know, but I think you've got to be very careful how you do that. Um, my colleague Audrey Trushka is an example of someone I think who um, wrote a spectacular, highly acclaimed book on uh, Sanskrit at the Mughal court, which won many prizes, and great acclaim. But then wrote a very short book on Aurangzeb without footnotes. And obviously, that uh, if you're going to tread into a, uh, uh, an area filled with landmines, you've got to tread very carefully. And you've got to come well defended, and uh, and I think that that's an example of a book which created a lot of controversy and, and didn't answer questions. However much her her basic line uh, may or may not have been right, uh, you know, the lack of footnotes and the lack of weight. It's only a hundred hundred page book, uh, and, and I didn't have any words, but not many. Uh, it 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 sought to make something popular but i think it didn't uh satisfy people because it didn't have the didn't have the sources and didn't, and didn't answer the question so i think if you are going to engage with controversial issues you have to come in well armed well primed with your evidence and, and engage generously and sensitively but then how do you deal with something like a uh, like an accusation that oh you're a white man how dare you touch our history etc which i'm sure you've you've had as well i mean privilege can be such a double edged sword and uh, uh, have you have you had your uh, 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 your bit of skirmishes on on that front i, I mean I, I, over the years i certainly have um, i've had it more fun enough of running than i have as a historian uh, i think as a, with the with books people tend to uh, you know engage with what you've written and, and they disagree or, or, or agree uh, not on the basis of your skin colour but on the basis of what you've written. Um, I run into more issues about running a literary festival uh, despite the fact that I you know, co-founded it and um, because that is perceived as, as a white person running something in India equal colonialism, equal imperialism. And so that generates accusations of being Lord Curzon or something. And people who don't know that you know, I help found the thing, uh, you know, do say, uh, you know, what is a white guy doing running a festival in India? This isn't the 19th century. This isn't the Raj. Um, and, uh, but I haven't, I don't get that as a historian so much. I, I, in the, I suppose at the beginning I got a little bit, but people, in a sense, I think, know who I am here now. Um, and um, no, I mean, I've been very, I mean, I've been received very generously in India. I'm extremely grateful. It, it isn't automatic that a, a, a white guy writing about colonial history uh, will be write, widely read. Uh, and my books have been massive. In fact, I now sell probably more copies in India than I do um, in Britain. Uh, and I'm very grateful to that. No, I think I think if you know if you if you treat people um, respectfully and uh, and, and engage politely, 
um, and tell the truth and do your work, people are open to, um, uh, to, to reading you, whatever your skin color, your the faith of your parents or, or the, the accent you speak with or whatever, you know. In that sense, I think, you know, books are a very, still a very wonderful world to be in. Um, you know, you, 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 unlike, for example, Hollywood, where you become a sort of, you know, celebrity and a, and a numinous figure who is, is, is there for anyone in the public to, to throw eggs at or, uh, uh, or worship or anything in between the two. Um, as a writer, you know, you're not recognized in the street. Uh, but, you know, if you go to a dinner party, you might meet someone who has enjoyed one of your books and, and likes it. So it's, it's a very uh, privileged and, and, and um, enjoyable and intellectually stimulating way to make a living. So I'm very grateful for that career. And I'm very grateful for India for allowing me to live here and study history. <laughs> anyway, I mean, that's that, that, creepy and oleaginous, but I do generally feel <laughs> <laughs> But uh, yeah, books are still a wonderful world. And uh, and uh, of course, from a fan and a reader, I would like to thank you from the bottom of my heart for giving that word, the right words to, um, uh, to explain it. And uh, really looking forward to the golden road. Um, I'm just hoping that uh, the lessons of the past that you are at pains to teach us are learnt and learnt well. So, <laughs> so thank you very much. Much, William for this conversation has been absolutely wonderful look at us all in our in our winter we should explain that this is the coldest Delhi winter any of us have had for years we're all dressed in outside clothes for inside <laughs> for <Permanently. inside. laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a cold, cold um, a winter in Delhi, but uh, we are hoping this conversation will warm you up. Uh, Teamwork Arts Podcast, ladies and gentlemen, uh, warm conversations about what goes behind the making of the arts. Uh, we hope you enjoyed yourselves. If you did, please leave us comments. That'll be uh, really, really nice. Uh, you can follow William on Twitter where there are some fantastic photographs to be seen and some brilliant threads to be followed as well. So please do that. Thank you very much for listening. What's coming up next? For that, you'll just have to follow us. But for now, thank you for listening. My name is Sarthak. Thank you, William. Thank you, Tata. If you've enjoyed this podcast, subscribe to our channel now. We have a new episode out every Friday.